Welcome. Thank you for joining us at Macaulay Author Series. My name is Charmaine Whitlow, and on behalf of Dean Mary Pearl and the entire Macaulay community, we are thrilled to have with us today Matthew Banneke. Um, he's from the class of 2005, and he was part of our inaugural class um, to Macaulay that started in 2001. Moderating today will be Samantha Fang, and she's with the class of, um, I'm sorry, 2023. So we're so happy that they both can join us. Um, I'm just going to read off um, their bio. So just give me one moment. And for Matthew is a writer of speculative, speculative fiction with supernatural and horror leanings and a craft beer blogger. He holds a bachelor's of business administration in finance and at from Baruch College, where he graduated as a member of the inaugural class of Macaulay Honor Scholars. He also holds a master's in adolescent English education from Brooklyn College. And while working at Baruch, he was selected to develop, implement, and instruct a summer long creative writing seminar for high school students in the College Now program, where he served as an adjunct lecturer. Since 2011, he has written and maintained the Beer Whispers craft beer blog. The Beer Whispers is followed by, followed by more than 50 bureau, bureaus, breweries, I'm sorry, from around the world, including nearly a dozen of the top 50 breweries as listed by the Brewers Association. He has visited more than 100 breweries, many of which have been reviewed on the blog. He has also sampled nearly 4,000 different beers. Wow. Aside from writing, Matthew is an avid photographer and musician. He enjoys landscape photography primarily, but is also interested in black and white photography. He is a self-taught guitarist and pianist who enjoys an electric, electric array of musical styles and artists ranging from modern metal acts to classical rock and classical compositions. So thank you so much, Matthew, for being with us tonight. And moderating tonight is Samantha Fang. And I know Samantha from our office at Macaulay. So Samantha is a rising junior at Macaulay Honors College at Hunter College, majoring in statistics and minoring in psychology. She's a former intern at Macaulay Career Deve Development Office and a current nonprofit or operations intern at Glamour Gals Foundation. She hopes to continue exploring different roles in the nonprofit, higher education, and consulting industries. I want to thank you both for joining us tonight. So happy to be here with you both. And what I'll do is have Samantha and Matthew now join us. Thanks, Charmaine. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Charmaine, for the warm introduction and to Matt for taking the time to speak with us this evening. We're so excited to have you join us for this Macaulay author event. Um, jumping right in, as Charmaine mentioned, you were part of Macaulay's inaugural class. So how do you feel the Macaulay Honors Program has shaped you and impacted you on an academic and professional level? Uh, well, first, I'd like to thank Macaulay for allowing me to partake in this event. It's sort of surreal to be in this position as a graduate of the program and now a writer, because uh, it was my dream even then. So uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, but to answer your question, Macaulay's impact um, really began from, from day one. I can think back to the orientation that we had at the Graduate Center in July of 2001. And what I remember from that week um, was this notion that they wanted New York City to be treated as a campus unto itself. and. To that end, I, I would say that Macaulay was immensely successful, right? Between the cross-campus projects and just all the different events um, that we had, you know, amongst the different uh, the campuses, it really transformed the city into a campus. But my takeaway was really more that New York City was a classroom. Uh, it was a place that we were able to explore and encouraged to explore, and it really. Um, enable us to learn in a way that I never had before. Uh, I'm sure most people, if not everyone, would probably agree with me that, you know, the first 13 years that we're in school uh, in New York, we're really taught at, okay, we're, we're passive uh, recipients of information and knowledge. We're kind of told what to learn, we're told how to learn it, and there really isn't much wiggle room. Um, and so my biggest takeaway from Macaulay was this transformation that, that they uh, engendered, where they turned us from those passive recipients 
into active participants in the learning process. We became agents of our own education. And I don't think I can underestimate just the importance of that because it reverberated straight through my time as an undergraduate student. And it really empowered me moving into graduate school uh, and, and my professional careers uh, as a teacher and as a writer um, to feel like I was in control of my own, my own journey. Um, and that's something that they encouraged literally from day one, so. I relate to so many of the experiences that you shared, especially about New York City being a classroom and having our professors encourage us to be agents of our own education. And it's so great to hear that right from the beginning, Macaulay has had such a significant and lasting, lasting impact on you right from the very first cohort. Um, you did major in finance while at Baruch and you eventually earned your bachelor's of business administration there. And so your story from going from a business student to an independent author is definitely very unique. So was writing and becoming an author always a dream of yours, even during your college years? Absolutely. And as a typical uh, of a journey as it was, um, I do feel like there are elements of it that are relatable. And, and I think that's something hopefully that that some, you know, some in attendance might find some value in. Um, I've known I've wanted to be a writer my entire life. Uh, I remember first grade, I had a poem published in the local newspaper and just seeing my name and something that I wrote like in print it resonated with me in a way that nothing had ever before and nothing has since. Um, and so I knew pretty early on that that's what I wanted to do. By the time I got to high school and it came time to decide, you know, what I wanted to do as a career, I, you know, discussed it with my parents and I said, yep, writing, this is it. And they said, not exactly. Uh, because their concerns for me were more financially oriented. They wanted me to have a strong financial foundation that I, that I could use to support myself and hopefully someday support a family. And the way they viewed it, you know, writing was something I could always pursue after a career, something more, you know, mainstream, if you will. So I said, okay, back to the drawing board. What can I do that, you know, is related to writing and has a steady paycheck and whatnot? So I said, well, teaching English, you know, is relevant. It overlaps. That's it. So I went back to them with that and they said, yeah, we don't know about that either uh, because of, you know, again, concerns about finances. So the only thing left on the drawing board was finance. My sister was involved in the field. It was really the only other thing I could even consider. And I'm so grateful that I did because I met my wife at that orientation and we were both Baruch students, uh, Heather McLaughlin. Um, and so my life would have been completely different had I followed my own advice. So I do appreciate you know, my parents' uh, intentions early on. Um, and, and not to dive too deeply into a long story, I, I do feel like this is salient to the, the discussion though, that. Um, you know, obviously going to Baruch for business, I went all in in that direction. And I was pretty fortunate that I want to say maybe early sophomore year, I had uh, an opportunity to apply for an internship. My business law professor thought I would be a great fit. He also worked at um, a mid-sized trading firm and there was an opening and he said, hey, come interview. So I, I did. And what I expected to be one interview turned into two, turned into three. And the next thing I knew, I was offered the internship. And I said, okay, great. You know, I'll take it. Didn't really think much of it. As it turns out, he didn't tell me that there were eight candidates from another uh, New York university, leave it at that, and uh, they had already selected a candidate from that pool. So I came in after that was done, and I guess I impressed them enough that they decided to take me. So just as a note for Macaulay students, our education as Baruch students or Macaulay students in general, we can rival you know, with the best of, uh, of what Ivy Leagues you know, produce as well. Um, and so I got the, the position, I was on a fast track for you know, a, a nice six figure job and all that stability. And a few months in, I was the last person in the office at like 1130 at night in a Dece cold December night. And I remember looking up at the Empire State Building you know, in Christmas colors thinking, what the hell am I doing with my life? Like I had this pit growing inside of me, this emptiness that I never even knew you know, could exist. And for the first time, I considered the intrinsic value of the work I was doing. And I just, I kind of knew in that moment, I can't do this. This isn't for me. Um, and so I decided that I was going to Audible and try to pursue that, that um, teaching career. But the problem was, I was sort of locked in at that point to the major and the course of action that I took. So I said, all right, well, I'll graduate as a business student and work towards getting into a graduate program somewhere. Um, and so that's what I was able to do. I finished with the BBA in finance. I enrolled in a few more English courses, and then I earned my master's in English education uh, at Brooklyn College. So I sort of had a, you know, audible and pivot along the way. 
Um, I thought all the pivoting was done when I earned the master's degree, but then I found out when we came back from a celebratory trip that there was a hiring freeze for teachers and my wife was pregnant with our first child. And nine months later, the freeze was still in effect and I became a stay-at-home dad who finally had that opportunity to pursue that writing career that he always dreamed of. Um, so it was a very convoluted journey to get to this point, um, but it's one that I tried to, to find value in every step along the way. And I think it really did serve to influence where I wound up, even if it was a crazy path you know, to get here. <laughs> I think that's so interesting. And also, thank you so much for sharing that. I think it shows for sure that a career in life is not linear and you can, you know, draw your five or 10 year plan all you want, but sometimes life just comes at you with all these different things and you have to learn to adapt along the way. And I think that the fact that you are ultimately able to achieve your dream is very inspiring. And I think one of the biggest takeaways from your story as well, um, going back to what you majored in, is the fact that one's major does not have to directly define one's career. Um, and so do you have any tips for students or alumni who are interested in pursuing writing, but are not or did not major in a closely related field? Absolutely. So it was a grueling process. Uh, I was the most type A of type A personalities. I had, you know, the plan, the backup plan, the backup plan for the backup plan. And I always viewed things very rigidly. And those experiences early on really forced me to become more adaptable, to become flexible. And if, if I were to give anyone advice, let alone, you know, current students, um, just people in general, it's, it's to be flexible, have plans, but understand that things may not work out the way that you expected them to. And if you're able to adjust and adapt on the fly, it really makes the process that much easier. Um, I know some people look, it, it's interesting, out of most, most of the writers that I've met have, you know, uh, English BAs or MFAs, you know, obviously related fields to, to what they do. But I view my experience at Baruch as a huge boom, it's a, it's a huge leg up because so much of writing is marketing. And that's something that, you know, folks who, who spent almost all their time in a liberal arts setting, they may not be as adept at that as I am because of the marketing courses I took, the exposure to business. So my takeaway is in terms of, you know, your dreams and, and maybe what you're hoping to achieve one day, if it doesn't overlap with what you're doing now, that's okay because you're still going to come to that future dream with experiences that you know may differ from other people and that may be what sets you apart. I think that's such a great point, especially about, I think any major has so many transferable skills and any experience, maybe you're in a job right now that you may not be fully satisfied with, but you're gaining a lot of experience here that you can apply to maybe a job that in the future is your dream. And so on the topic of career pivots and transferable skills, I know that you did attend graduate school. As you mentioned, um, you got your master's in adolescent English education at Brooklyn College. So can you talk a bit more about your experience with graduate education and how it has impacted your career and whether you recommend it for other aspiring authors? Sure. So I loved my four years as a Macaulay student. I didn't think education could get any better than that. And then I had graduate school as an experience. And it was something almost completely different because, you know, um, I don't know, there, there's something more calming about being in graduate school. At that point, you already have a focus. You know, it, it's more professional folks who are at a different stage in their career, They're not necessarily starting out. Um, and so just the experience in the classroom and everything um, was just really, really inspiring. Uh, if Macaulay, taught us how to, you know, how to learn um, and, and how to become agents of our own education. I would say my, my graduate school experience at Brooklyn College taught me how to research. And that may not sound like a big deal, but let me tell you, especially in the modern climate that we have now where, you know, people don't really know what the definition of facts might be, learning how to source your materials um, is really critical to informing yourself on any topic. Um, and so we sort of learned uh, in graduate school, you know, to follow the chain of sources back up um, to, you know, really the primary one. Um, and the benefit of that is you start to learn how people think, right? You learn the inspirations behind whatever it is you happen to be, um, be studying. And so I would absolutely recommend graduate school for anybody um, because of that experience. For me, <laughs> so at the time that I was in Brooklyn College, my typical day when I was student teaching started in Staten Island at around 4.30 in the morning. I would take the bus uh, and then the ferry and then the bus again, did my student teaching for a couple of hours, then worked at Baruch, 
took the express bus home to get the car to drive to Brooklyn to take my courses to drive home and have dinner at like nine or 10 o'clock and started all over again. That experience, that grind taught me that I could handle just about anything. And, you know, while maintaining grades and, you know, just, just doing all of the, the outside external things. Um, and so there's intangible benefits to, to grad school um, and obvious, you know, career benefits as well. So I would definitely recommend it. All right. And now that we have a better sense of your educational journey, as well as your professional journey so far, I think now is a great time to start discussing your written work. Um, as Charmaine mentioned earlier, you're a writer of speculative fiction with supernatural and horror leanings and are currently in the process of writing the fifth book to your Cosmogonia book series. So can you share more about the genre of fiction that you write, as well as a brief overview of your series for those in the audience who have not yet been introduced to your work? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the most difficult question that I was asked during those first few years as a writer was, oh, what's your book about? And it seems like the simplest one, but I would always be like, oh, you know, well, it's sort of about this and it's sort of about that. And it was incredibly frustrating not knowing how to answer that question adequately. And then I stumbled upon the speculative fiction genre. And I had never heard of it at the time. I don't know how many in, in attendance are aware of it, but speculative fiction is basically uh, an amalgam of a bunch of different uh, genres. It pulls a little bit from a variety of places without really leaning too far, too heavily into any one of them. So my books in particular have some supernatural elements, some horror, as you can see by the photograph uh, on the slideshow, um, fantasy. It's really, it's really a representation of who I am specifically, because whether it's my musical interests or photography, books, whatever I'm into, it's, it's very eclectic. I like to learn about as much, you know, of a variety as possible. And I think that's really what influenced my books. Um, I started writing my first book, The Lion in the Desert, while I was a student at Baruch. Uh, and um, I think my experience as a Macaulay scholar gave me the confidence to believe in my writing ability and to think that this was something that I might be able to do long term. Um, and so over the next few years, it really helped me to develop that story and find my written voice. Um, and so I became more aware of, of my vision for the book series and what I wanted to do. Um, I don't know if you want me to dive too deep, you know, into the books themselves. Feel free to go on. Yeah. Talk about your book, anything you'd like. So that, that uh, picture that's on the screen is an oil painting of the opening scene for my first book, The Lion in the Desert. Um, and it was inspired in part by, you know, um, real life experiences that I had that I thought, hey, this would be really interesting to, to put in a book somehow. And so this is a recurring nightmare that the main character, Tim Channing, has been suffering through for months. Um, and so my friend Anthony Jensen, who's a tremendous artist from Brooklyn, um, was kind enough to, to paint this for me. And I feel like it really sets the scene better than my words can, right? A picture's worth a thousand words. So I think this one might be worth a little more, uh, but it, it really gives you an idea of, you know, sort of the visual element. And in terms of my writing style, you know, when I was growing up, my mom was a huge Stephen King fan. So that was really what I grew up reading um, before branching off into, you know, every direction imaginable. Um, and then when I got to Baruch, and then uh, further along in, in grad school, I started to develop an appreciation for literary fiction. I fell in love with James Joyce. And, you know, I noticed that uh, the literary folks kind of like looked down upon the popular fiction, right? Like the Stephen King stuff. And the Stephen King fans didn't know what to make of the literary fiction stuff. And I thought, hmm, maybe that's, you know, uh, a, niche, a niche that I could sort of fill, you know? Uh, and so I took, I tried to marry the popular commercial sensibilities of like a Stephen King book with some of the more technical, you know, writing styles of a James Joyce or, you know, even poets, T.S. Eliot. And I felt like the language uh, could be elevated beyond what you typically find in like pop fiction, you know? And so that was an emphasis of mine. Like, can I come up with, you know, interesting places and interesting faces and then describe them in a way that maybe a, a typical, you know, author may not do. So that was, you know, what I tried to, to carve out for myself there. Um, can you share a little bit more about where you get your inspiration to write? Sure, absolutely. So again, going back to that eclectic aspect, um, I can't speak for other writers, um, but I know that, you know, I would imagine that most authors are inspired by other authors. And while that's true for me, my largest influences, the, the most potent ones, 
are completely unrelated to to books. Um, it's like the Final Fantasy uh, video game series, the television show Lost hands down was my biggest influence. Uh, and I've peppered little references, you know, throughout my books, you know, and sort of a, an homage to, to those things. Um, and, and that's really how I go about things. Um, I draw inspiration pretty much from everywhere. Uh, and, be, and it's because you never know when something is going to strike you, you know, as usable in, in, you know, in writing, whether it's an idea, a place, a person, whatever it happens to be. And some of the best, you know, inspirations that I found were like 90 degree turns from what they actually were. Like it was something unrelated that inspired a completely different direction. Um, and so, you know, when I was reading, like we had philosophy courses at Baruch. And so I got more into the idea of like thinking about thinking. And that's actually a big element of these books. So Cosmogonia series, Cosmogonia is the, the Greek origin of the word cosmogony, right? Which is the study of the origins of the universe. And that was a big inspiration for this series because I realized every religion, every secular culture, science itself, everyone has a, a story for how they think the, the universe began. It's something that unites like everybody across the board. So I thought that would be kind of cool to come up with my own like fictional take on the same thing because of that universality. And it just sort of flowed from there, you know, um, the, the notion that there, there are like three governing forces in the universe, right? You have like fate and destiny as one thing, then there's this like random element of, or, or element of randomness. Uh, and, you know, that goes beyond that control that, that predetermined stuff and then free will. And so the interplay of those three things really dominates um, the, the direction of, of all of the books. And I know in the second one, The Walking Ghosts, there's actually a, a stretch where these characters sort of have this conversation uh, about that, that type of thing. But my, um, my goal in writing these books was not to do what typically happens in fiction, right? Fiction is all about suspension of disbelief. And I didn't want that. Like, I didn't want to have a cat person, you know, flying through space or doing whatever. And, and that's not to say that that's not worthy. But for me, I wanted to put someone that felt like, you know, they could be each of us, like an everyday person having an everyday life and normal experiences. What would happen if one of us found ourselves in just this insane situation? How would we actually react, you know? Because I feel like a lot of times it starts out that way. And then all of a sudden, you know, the next thing you know, uh, the hero is she's a queen now, right? Or this person is some noble warrior. And I wanted to, to stick with that, that idea of, no, this is still a normal person in these increasingly stranger circumstances. Um, and so that's where that speculative fiction genre allows me that wiggle room to, uh, to explore those things. Um, hearing you talk about your books so interesting. I'm also curious about your writing process now that you've described kind of um, what you've written about um, and how you get your inspiration. I'm interested about your writing process and also um, how you've seen, how you react to all the feedback that you're getting, you know, with each book and now you're on the fifth book um, and your reaction to all of that from people who are fans of your book and your series. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so when I started The Lion in the Desert, I thought that was the book. I thought it was, I had the beginning and the end written before anything else. And I figured, well, I'll just fill in the middle. Well, filling in the middle has taken me almost 15 years, I think, from when I started until now. And it's gone way beyond the page count that I, I thought I would have initially. Um, and you know, uh, the writing process itself has been steady. That, that is one thing, if there are any writers out there or, or folks looking to break in, Understanding your writing process and having a writing process is the most important aspect of it because, you know, you need that consistency and you need to be able to put yourself sort of into the, the position to write. So for me, music is hands down the most important thing. Like uh, no matter where I write, I have to have music. Um, and early on, it was harder, you know, when I was doing it like the early 2000s because, you know, access was limited to whatever I had on CD or whatever. Now, especially with YouTube, I found uh, Adrian von Ziegler is this amazing composer um, from Europe who sort of pairs nature sounds with, um, you know, actual instrumentation and stuff. And so as my books have moved into a more fan fantasy setting, I can listen to his music and, and feel transported to these places that I'm trying to go. So music is, is really, really important. Even in the first book, um, I just added a, a couple of different songs when I was writing it just for variety. And one of them was called Darkness by a metal band of all things called Disturbed. It's like the only soft song that they have. 
and I turned it on and I had intended to write, you know, one thing. And all of a sudden I closed my eyes as the song started and I just saw snow falling and crisscrossing spotlights. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. Let me follow this, this rabbit hole here. And that added not only a completely new section to that book, but the second most important antagonist in the series and maybe open the door to everything else that came. And that was literally just by randomly picking this one song that, you know, I had heard a couple of days prior. Um, so for me, music is very important uh, to my writing process, but other folks may have something else. Probably coffee. I think a lot of writers would agree with that. That's so cool that music has had such a huge impact on your writing. And I'm so glad you got to share that because I feel like readers may not know the backstory behind certain characters just by reading that. So. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, now that we know a little bit more about you as an author and also more about your books, I do want to talk more about your experience as an independent author, because I think many people interested in pursuing a similar career path may be intimidated by where to start, you know, from finding an illustrator to self-publishing. So do you have any tips or advice from your experience becoming and working as an independent author? Absolutely. The single most difficult aspect of my writing journey was choosing to become an independent author. My goal from day one was, uh, you know, a traditional publishing contract. I wanted to be with Viking, or Random House, Penguin, you know, one of the top ones, New York Times bestsellers list. I had this very specific, you know, idea of, of what I wanted for myself. And funny enough, in grad school, one of my classmates uh, was a writer and I didn't realize it at first. And we just happened to be discussing it one day. And he had written the novelizations for something like 25 Star Trek movies, and episodes, he was really, really well known in the, the science fiction circle. So of course I tried to tap his brain and, and find out like, hey, you know, how do I get into that? And he said, you don't want to. He said, what you want to do is, is go the independent route. This was about 2008. And I was shocked because to that point, you know, uh, it was taboo to even consider self-publishing, right? Self-publishing was for writers who couldn't cut it uh, with the traditional publishing route. And I was terrified of being like blacklisted or, you know, having a, a black mark on my record uh, if I had self-published any books and ruined my chances of getting an agent and going that route. And so I wrestled with that for years because I liked what he said about, uh, you know, indie publishing, but it just, I felt like I was sacrificing my dreams to that end. To make a long story short, I went through the querying process. I went through the process of, you know, submitting my books for writing competitions and everything. And the process made me miserable. And it got so bad that I fell out of love with writing and that scared me more than anything else. And so I decided to reevaluate, again, pivoting, right? Like we discussed earlier, I decided to reevaluate my goals. And, and I asked, what do I want out of this? And what do I get enjoyment out of? And I realized that just the act of writing was it. Like, that's what I loved. I loved writing the stories. And if I satisfied myself with them, if I met my own expectations, and then I was able to share it with anybody else. If anyone else liked it, that was great. But I wasn't worrying about, you know, uh, writing something that was editorially perfect or commercially viable. You know, I, I wrote it for me. And in terms of being an indie author, it opened up so many doors for me creatively. Uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, my interest in photography. I parlayed that into, you know, a, a basic skill set in Photoshop and, and graphic design and, and being an independent author gives me the opportunity to design my own book covers in, in certain cases, to do the layout myself, to do marketing, you know, um, come up with marketing promo images and stuff. And those are things that I love. And if I were to go the traditional route, I would lose agency over that. And that was something I really wasn't comfortable with. And either way, the way the industry is now, you're you're on your own for marketing. You know, you're you're largely expected to do your own events and do you know <laughs> do the legwork without reaping 100% of the benefits. And so um, I said, if I'm gonna put in that effort and time anyway, I might as well do it on my own terms. Um, now that I heard you say that your friend was one, was someone who inspired you to go the independent author route, do you have any other mentors in this space that kind of help you um, when you're creating a new book, when you're ready to release a new book, or when you're thinking about next steps um, as an author that you look up to? Sure. So. Um... I don't know if it's necessarily mentors per se, uh, but I'm actively involved in something called the writing community on Twitter. Um, I, one of my daughter's uh, friends, her mother is uh, like a, a maven in marketing and she was kind enough to let me, you know, hire her for an advisory, you know, session. And 
she really, you know, emphasized the importance of social media. And funny enough, she worked on the Lost marketing team. I don't know if anybody remembers the show Lost. Like back in the day, it was like the biggest, the water cooler show to end all water cooler shows. So for her to have been involved in like the viral marketing and stuff just blew my mind. And she, you know, explained to me the importance of building a social media brand and, you know, and having these interactions. And so um, that's... A, a big section of where I draw my inspiration from is just other writers because we're all sharing the same space and you know uh, invariably you have folks who are you know competing with you it's, it's cannibalistic at times but there are enough good you know good folks who who want to see others succeed as much as you know they themselves do so I, I do find inspiration um in you know in them and if I have any questions you know it's it's like a built-in uh support system so um, adding on to my previous question, what does a typical day or week look like for you as an independent author? So I guess that's a tough question to ask and to answer because I'm not sure if I would categorize myself as an independent writer first or a stay-at-home parent first because the parenting really you know, has dominated the, the time and it's really what sets the schedule. I've had to fit the writing into that, um, which thankfully this past school year, you know, the kids were back in full time. Um, so that helps, you know, tremendously. Um, but typically, you know, I think it's important for writers to find not just their own writing voice, their, their writing habits, but like, see what works for yourself. You know, um, I don't, I don't, I'm sure you guys have all heard, you know, the phrase aspiring writer, right? You might not think much about it, but that phrase drives me absolutely nuts because people, I don't know, sometimes people identify it with like this nobility, right? The sense of, well, I'm an aspiring writer. To me, all it says is you're too afraid to become an actual writer, right? You're, there's something holding you back that's keeping you in the aspiring field instead of the actual work part of it. And I think part of the way of bridging that gap where you take your dream from a concept into something more concrete um, is understanding what you want out of the experience and learning what works for you. So for me, you know, in terms of a given day or week, I work better in the morning um, and I'm limited, you know, some writers will adhere to this like insane, they have to write 2000 words a day or else. And I'd rather write 500 really good words in four or five hours than arbitrarily just, you know, type stuff and, and call it a day. So for me, I, I try to get the writing done in the morning and I try to intersperse, you know, writing sessions, sometimes with reviewing sessions, or really just sitting and thinking about what I'm doing, you know, and, and that's, they call it uh, plotsers or pantsers. And so the difference is plot plotsers are folks who um, really write out a solid plot for their books in advance, like a framework that they follow, like from point A to point Z. And pantsers are ones that just sort of sit and type and, you know, they fly by the seat of their pants and whatever happens, happens. And so for me, I'm somewhere in the middle. And so I'll sit down and try to write, you know, maybe once a week, instead of actually writing a book, writing the book, I'll sit and I'll write notes. And it just, it, it alleviates some of those, you know, stressful moments of like, ah, oh, crap, now I'm stuck. What do I do? You know, I can refer back to those, those notes and um, use them, you know, as a, as a new directional point. And I think uh, what you mentioned is uh, very important because as a parent, you're able to balance both which I think is very uh, unique to um, the path that you have chosen. Um, I also have a question about just how long does it normally take you to write a book? Or as you mentioned, you have the freedom to kind of decide like when you're going to decide to write and when you're gonna have a writing session. So do you have kind of a general idea when you start writing a book, how long or how many months or years it will take you to reach that end? Sure, I think it, I think it depends in large part on, on how well fleshed out the idea is. Um, because I think the clearer you are on what you want out of the experience, the more smoothly the process goes. And most importantly, the more flexible you are, not to, to harp on that word, but the more you submit yourself to the writing process and really let the story take itself over once you reach that point, um, it just facilitates the whole thing so much more smoothly. I know for me, the writing in the, the lion in the desert I think I wrote between 2002 and 2007. And I mean, I was handwriting notes on the express bus from Brooklyn. I was writing on lunch breaks when I worked at Baruch. Um, my, my boss, Jennifer Lee, who is still within CUNY, um, best boss I've ever had, extremely caring and understanding of you know where I was at at that time. 
And, you know, she would give me that leeway, you know, if I was on a lunch break to go and write. And so I would try to squeeze a couple paragraphs in, you know, at Baruch. And that process is very, very disjointed. And so it took me, you know, a solid five years to write that first book. Once I streamlined it and had more time to work on it at home, the next book took only three. Um, and then it was three for book three. And I want to say maybe two for book four. So I think I'm getting a little better at it uh, as I go along. And the goal for this, uh, this most recent one that I'm working on now, the finale, is to finish it this year. So that would be one year. So I guess I'm making progress uh, with each one. That's so exciting. Um, in addition to your Cosmogonia book series, you have also written nonfiction work about craft beer and fitness and also maintain a craft beer blog. And along the same vein, I think many students and alumni have a lot of different interests and passions, but maybe unsure as to how to combine them all into one career or one path. So since you have been able to combine so many of your interests and passions into what I think is such a great example of a fulfilling career, do you have any advice for anyone struggling in this area and trying to figure out how they can pursue all the different things that make them happy? Sure. I, th I think that just 2021 in general, right? We're at such an amazing time in terms of, uh, of access. You know, in, in certain ways, there's an excess of access. There's too much screen time, too much whatever. But if, if you can sort of focus your attention and, and utilize the resources you have available to you, you really can do almost anything you want. And I feel like anybody, whether you're currently a student or, you know, you're, you've been involved in a career for decades, we all have passions. We all have things that drive us and define us. And again, going back to that aspiring writer aspect, I think they're always dreams deferred, you know, and, and it's always something that people want to do. They don't know how to start, or maybe they're afraid to start. Um, and so if you have these passions, if you have something you're interested in, find a way to engage it. It doesn't necessarily have to, you don't necessarily have to jump right into, you know, the ultimate goal, set smaller goals for yourself, you know, and, and be willing to accept little victories on the way towards, you know, that ultimate aim that, that you might be going towards. You know, for me, that's how it started with the beer blog. Um, my wife and I, it, when we moved to New Jersey, uh, you know, there were more breweries than we had ever seen at that point. And it really wasn't that many, but we had fun going and visiting them and interacting with people. And after a couple of, of trips to different places, I said, oh, I love writing. I love beer. I, I would love to find a way to help these, you know, businesses out. I said, let me, you know, work on this beer blog. And so it started out as a passion project and just sort of snowballed from there um, completely organically. And that's, that's sort of what kills me. I can sit here and do all the, you know, detailed marketing work as I want for my books. And then I look at the beer blog where I was just like, I would write an entry, I would tweet it out. And then the next thing I know, I have all this followership from within the industry, from beyond the industry. So you never know what's, what's going to, you know, going to happen. Um, and, and another um, passion that, that um, Charmaine mentioned is, is music. That's another one that I, I don't really put a lot of emphasis on, um, but I've gotten more adept, um, you know, through playing guitar and piano, at, like being able to, to pick out songs and stuff. And in guitar, there's something, it's like sheet music, but it's called tablature. And so that's how a lot of guitarists learn songs. And so I've been able to develop my skills where I can write out, you know, by ear, um, different tablatures for, for different songs and share that. And I happened to go on the other day and I want to say, I think those tabs have almost 130,000 views in like 70 countries. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. You know, so you, the point is you never know what's going to happen with, you know, with your interests, but take those first steps, just find some way to engage with it beyond just the cerebral part, you know, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at what snowballs from there. Absolutely. And I think um, from what you said, it's clear that you can find community through all the different um, interests that you have through craft beer, but also through music, through writing. There's a community for everything. And I think that's very important, especially now with social media. Um, so thank you, Matt, for all of those great responses and advice. I'm now going to read off some questions from the audience. Um, so once again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to use the Q&A feature to submit them. We'll try our best to get through them all. Um, so the first question here is from Brianne. She asks, what advice do you have for parents with young children to encourage their natural curiosity and inclination to write stories and make books? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so children are innately curious. And I think maybe culturally going back a couple of decades, you know, um, there was an era where kids were meant to be seen and not heard. And, and that creativity, I think, was largely stifled and stunted. Nowadays, I think the culture around parenting has changed a little bit and kids are encouraged to explore um, that curiosity, you know, and 
as a parent, it's hard sometimes because our natural instinct is to correct. And I think that that is detrimental at times to kids, especially younger kids. You know, if my daughter comes over to me with, you know, when she was three or two with a scribble, you know, and she says, daddy, look at this tree that I drew. I'm not going to crush her dreams and, and point out that, you know, there's no leaves or, or whatever, you know, I, I want to find a way to encourage it. And when applicable, you know, try to help them to develop their skill set. Um, and it's really more about building them up than tearing them down, I think. Um, so I, I think it's important to encourage them um, and, and to give them guidelines and, and help when you can. Um, we have another question from Michael. Uh, what do you think you will do upon completing book five of the Cosmogonia series? Oh, that's a great question. My son was actually asking me. And when I said before about having different goals and everything, I never imagined how cool it would be to have my 11 year old son like want to read my books and then love them and be on me, you know, about finishing this last one because he wants to, to read the finale of the series. That's just the coolest thing, you know, that I've had happen so far. Um, and so in discussing, you know, what my future plans are, uh, you mentioned earlier about inspirations and inspiration can hit strike at any time. So I've always had either a piece of paper and a pen or my phone handy. And so I've jotted down dozens of ideas for stories, whether it's novels or short stories or what, I don't know. So I think once I finish this series, I want to get a complete break from everything that I've done stylistically and, and whatnot. And I think I'm going to just test out some of those ideas and just see if I can develop maybe a little short story collection or something like that. The other thing to, to refer back to Brianne's question, um, I may actually write a, my, all three of my children are voracious readers. They read a lot. And so I thought maybe it would be cool to write a, a young adult literature series just for them, you know, maybe starring them or something that like I could collaborate um, with them on because they love writing too. So those are, those are the two things I think I'm gonna do later this year. And adding on to that, if anyone in our audience is interested in following and reading your work or reaching out to you after the event, where can they find you? Um, so <clears throat> if they go to my website, matthewjohnbenneke.com, um, there is social media links and email. Um, that's my pr primary site where I have all of the books um, and the artwork that you were so kind to, to share earlier. Um, eventually I'm gonna have a, a dedicated section for that. Uh, I did want to point out real quick, I know I mentioned my friend Anthony Jensen was the um, artist who created that initial scene. The spookier stuff uh, towards the middle was actually photography done by um, Andre Cosma, who is an amazing photographer from trans, uh, he does his work in Transylvania of all places. And I encountered him completely by chance when I was researching something and we struck up a friendship and now we collaborate. Um, and so I really encourage you to check out both of their stuff, as well as the third artist, who is a phenomenal digital, um, digital artist named Chauncey Felice. And all three of them have a variety of, of um, artwork either available for sale or just to, to explore. So I really encourage you to check their stuff out too. Um, and I believe I have links to all of them on my, my, main, my main website as well. I just sent the artist information in the chat for anyone who missed it earlier as well. So please support those artists. Um, we do have another question from an audience member. Do you have any aspirations to start another side project, perhaps moving beyond beer to something new? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the beer thing, so the, the beer blog itself was and still is just a passion project. The beer book is a little different. So when I was bumping into those uh, roadblocks trying to get published, I thought maybe I just need a writing credit to my name that I could use as a, a foot in the door. And so I thought, again, like, what are my interests? I was really into to, um, fitness, physical fitness. I've always been into sports and exercising. And then I was also into beer. And most people don't associate those two things as being, you know, overlapping. But you'd be surprised at how many runners do beer, you know, uh, beer uh, 5Ks and 10Ks or come to breweries and stuff. And so I knew that the audience was there for it. And I said, all right, I'm going to write a hybrid guide to craft beer where I could explain, you know, about the brewing process. Cause at the time I was home brewing as well. So there would be the beer side of it and then the fitness side of it. And, you know, people could take whatever they wanted out of it. Um, and I had publisher interest, which was great. But I realized that the beer people didn't know what to do with the fitness side and the fitness folks didn't know what to do with the beer side. So what I thought was a, a bonus really didn't pan out that way. So I think moving forward, uh, if I were to do any other side projects, um, 
involving other interests, I would have to, you know, plot that out a little more carefully. I do have a really cool, I'm going to be recording audiobook versions of my Cosmogonia series once I finish writing the fifth book. And um, that photographer, Andre Cosma, and I are already working on something really, really cool. So obviously, audiobooks are almost exclusively just spoken, you know, especially if they're on Audible or, or big platforms. So what we want to do is we're going to do, I guess what we're calling like an audio visual book. So we're combining his visual skills, his, his you know, photography and artwork and stuff um, with my narrative and then um, combining it with music from Adrian Von Ziegler to create sort of like a, an all encompassing multimedia experience uh, that we'll probably post on YouTube or something. So I think that'll be a, a fun side project to go for. That sounds so exciting. I'm also interested as well, if you're interested in writing more nonfiction uh, rather than fiction books. I do. So funny enough, um, when, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, my wife Heather and I were the first Macaulay couple to have a Macaulay baby, if you will. So Timmy was born uh, in 2010 and Macaulay um, sort of chronicled that experience. We, we discussed different ways that we could, you know, do something related to, to Timmy's birth. And so I started a blog that was meant to be, you know, a, a parenting blog called the Stay at Home Scholar. Um, and so they, you know, followed us for a little bit and, you know, um, chronicled Heather's first day back to work. And, you know, it, it was cool. And it was for a specific, I think it was the 10 year reunion um, back in 2010. Um, but that blog I've used as sort of, a, of an outlet. Um, I had some crazy experiences as a teenager working at a local supermarket. Uh, I mean, just off the wall, th things you'd never believe uh, happened. So I tried my hand at, at nonfiction, but with like a comedic tilt. So, you know, I've dabbled in, in different areas um, in that regard. So, you know, my problem is, I think with certain things, especially with like sports, like I love coaching, I'm very actively involved in my kids, you know, individual um, athletic careers. So maybe I could see myself doing something related to that or with music. Um, so I'm not sure right now, you know, the primary focus is, is on fiction, but we'll see. I'm definitely open to, to anything. Um, we do have another question from an audience member. Um, Jeff asks, how much of your graduate school studies helped you to become the writer you are today versus just your natural desire to write since you were a kid? That, that's, that's a phenomenal question because I didn't really feel like a writer until I got to graduate school. Uh, I definitely suffered from imposter syndrome. Uh, I had, you know, several, even at Baruch, uh, which is, you know, business forward, so many of our, our peers in Macaulay were liberal arts majors and English majors in particular. I know uh, Bill Chang um, published, actually had his book published um, not long after we graduated. And so, you know, it was intimidating for me to have this passion for it, but have a different background, say, than, than my other writer friends. And even though I had, you know, always received top marks for papers and, and stuff like that, I was really hesitant to, to go into, you know, the, the fiction realm because I didn't know if I could cut it. I didn't know if I had the chops to do it. And once I got to graduate school and I really, I, I saw validation in the grades and the feedback I was receiving from my professors, I realized it wasn't just for papers. It wasn't just academic writing. It was writing in general. And so that empowered me to believe a little more in myself and, and to be a little less critical um, and, and, you know, really hone what I was doing. So um, I would definitely credit both Macaulay and then Brooklyn College with making me the writer that I am now, because that's where I got the technical, you know, know-how and also the self-confidence. Um, adding on to that question, you mentioned imposter syndrome. Um, do you have any advice for people who are struggling with this, especially, you know, comparing yourself to, in your case, other authors or getting caught up in the numbers or deciding whether a certain book is more successful than the other book or feeling like um, maybe you're not always going to be, you maybe reached a peak or something like that. So dealing with imposter syndrome in this space. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I was dealing with it with this space, like specifically, uh, I saw so many of the other folks who have taken part, not just in the author talk series, but just, you know, uh, alumni newsletters in general. And I'm always so thrilled and so proud to be a part of this community and to see the phenomenal things that, that um, my peers are doing. But when it came time for me to step up, you know, I was dragging my feet. Poor Charmaine, you know, had to ask me like five times to send like bio information because I was really, really reticent to take part in this because I really didn't feel worthy in comparison with every, you know, everyone else who had preceded me here. And of course, you know, um, my wife was like 
absolutely not. They wouldn't ask you to do this if, you know, if they didn't want you there, if, if you weren't, you know, valued. And so it made me take a more critical look at that insecurity that I had and really find something of value. Obviously, you know, I don't have a New York Times bestseller. I don't have, you know, um, an Edgar Award or, you know, or, or accolades that maybe other writers in the series do. But what I do have is a unique story, a journey that they don't have. And one that's, you know, specific, I think, to um, Macaulay and, and relatable, not just to students, but hopefully, you know, uh, other folks within the, the Macaulay community at large. And so, to combat that imposter syndrome feeling, it was more, instead of focusing on what I didn't have and, and where I felt I was lacking, I tried to look at what I could bring, what value I could add. And, and there, there's always going to be something, there's something special about each of us. And if we can find that, I think that's going to really, you know, help you go a lot further than focusing on, you know, maybe where you think you're lacking. Adding on to what Charmaine mentioned in the chat, I think you're an amazing guest. I I think you were an excellent choice and I'm so inspired by your career journey and thank you for sharing your experiences and all your advice. I think everyone in the audience is so inspired by you and are excited to learn more about your books and read your books and support you as well as the artists that you mentioned today. And that concludes our event. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Charmaine for some closing remarks. Can I just say something real quick? Yeah, of I, course. <laughs> you said inspirations. Um, and I wanted just to, to shout out two people in particular because they are, hands down the most inspiring people in my life. Um, the first is my wife, Heather McLaughlin. Um, without her, her support through, you know, our time at Baruch and especially now, I would not be who I am or where I am without her. Um, she's more than just, you know, the mom to our kids and, and our, our breadwinner, you know, she, she's the source of all the good stuff in my life. So I love her and, and I wanted to, to thank her for everything. And the other inspiration is someone who was really, really critical to the early days of Macaulay, um, even before it was called Macaulay. Uh, and that's Dr. Susan Locke. Um, anyone from Baruch and, and uh, the Honors College at large at that time uh, is probably aware of, of Dr. Locke. And her influence has just been incredible. Uh, if, if you know her, she's touched your life. And she was more than just a professor and you know, uh, a mentor, um, a mother figure to, to a lot of us. Uh, and, and now I'm proud to be able to say after all these years that, that she's a friend. And so I just wanted to say, Dr. Locke, on behalf of everyone from my class and Heather and, and I specifically, we love you. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. So thank you. Wow, I'm like tearing up. This was fantastic. And you've said such amazing things, especially that, you know, your life and your journey has been so inspiring, knowing that you came into Macaulay during that dark time of 9-11. You, your whole cohort had to pivot. And now we're in this kind of dark path while coming into a light, thank goodness, where our students had to pivot as well. So I know that they will gain a lot of great information and inspiring stories from what you've just um, talked about today with your different pivoting from one thing to the next and what Baruch has done for you as well with your major in business and how you took that and used it to now for your writing. So, so inspirational. And we are so proud and happy to have you here um, with us tonight. And we definitely will love to have you back again. Um, just to let you know that you were our first cohort. We are now, we just had our commencement last week for the class of 2021 and we are bringing in the class of 2025. So. Uh, Macaulay is it's growing. We're going into our 20th anniversary this fall. So um, we have a lot to be thankful for. Our students are winning prestigious awards, but they're also inspiring other students as well and us. Um, you know, staff members have who have been there um, from the beginning and seen you all just doing amazing things, and we're so proud of you. So Thank you so much for joining us, Matthew, and coming back, returning to Macaulay, your home. It will always be your home and same for Heather and your family. Thank you so much to Samantha. I know you had, um, it was probably a challenging semester this 
year and a half has been challenging and thank you for taking time out um, of your schedule um, to host this as well. Um, for everyone in the audience, thank you. Um, just to let you know, we will be having an online auction supporting our students that's starting on June 16th through the 23rd. So um, just look at our website, there's great items to bid on and hopefully um, you'll see something that you like, but it will be supporting our students. Thank you again, and we hope to see you at the next Macaulay series, author series, thank you. Thank you, Charmaine. Take thank care. You. Thank you.